This is a day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's good to see you all here on this very special morning. As you all know, it is Remembrance Sunday. I don't see too many poppies around, but I'm sure you've been wearing them all week. It is Remembrance Sunday. Yes, I see. Good, good, yeah. And um, this is a day when we special, which is specially devoted to the memory of those who have died in military service since 1914. A picture which I don't know has changed much in 2023. Anyway, as we gather together, let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for bringing us together this morning for waking us up to see the sun, which is a reminder that you're always with us, for giving us a night's rest so that we can come together to worship you, for bringing us together to praise you, to worship you. We ask your blessing, O Lord, on us this morning. Heavenly Father, this morning and all of history is about you. Please help us to worship you with an undistracted heart. You know how the mind wanders to the upcoming week, the present worries, and thoughts of others and other things. Help us to put those thoughts away and focus on you and your glory. Amen. Once again, I would like to welcome you all. And I'm very glad to see you here today, Mr. Mike. Good that you can be with us today. And I see you also in the corner over there, Maxine. Good to see you both today. Welcome back after your time away. And I don't know if I'm missing out on anybody else, but it's always happy. It's always a good time to see you here again. Oh, yes, and here's Mr. Don't tell me. Bocelli. Boccaccio. I know it was a bo something. <laughs> Mr. Boccaccio, welcome back. Um, today, our service and our prayers will be focused on, as I said, the special day that we are commemorating. And on the overheads, we're going to have a poem, which I will read. And then it's followed by a prayer, which we all will say. And the poem is, what do we remember today? What do we remember today? The child with the gun? The shell of the house? The crumble of dreams? The breaking of bodies and peace? The ringing of airs? The screaming of shot, the shrapnel of brick, the breaking of cover and trust, the bearing of arms, the bearing of grief, the bearing of news, the breaking of treaties and trust, the braving of stairs, the shaking of heads, the silence of days, the breaking of promise and hearts, the living for peace, the longing to change, the disarming of hate, the breaking of patterns of war, the piercing of death, the weeping of friends, the anguish of grief, the rising and breaking of bread. It's a bit heavy, I know, all that's said here. But let us pray. The prayer will be on the overheads. Prayer, a God of peace. Let us read this together. God of peace and gentleness, we remember with deep sorrow the fault, fear, and failure that repeatedly leads to the forming of enemies, the escalation of hatred, and to war. 
We repent of our complicity in cycles of violence. Once again, welcome to our service here at South Sound United on this the 12th of November. Whether you're here in church or listening at home, always good to have you. A few announcements. 
Um, before we go on, uh, if you remember Reverend and Mrs. Davidson, they were here with us for a while. Uh, some of you do, I'm sure. Well, they send their greetings and would like the congregation to know that they still hold us all with fond memories. They're back in Jamaica now, as you all know, and they would like us to bear in mind that they have fond memories of us all here. Um, Bible study continues on Wednesday at 7. You can follow us on Zoom. I will be inviting Nadine up here in a minute to talk about family service. Nadine? Okay, okay. Um, while she comes up, I'll tell you also that there is an evening of music at John Gray next Sunday. Um, we've been announcing this for quite a while now. Um, it would be good if any of us could turn up for that. Um, okay, Miss Nadine, I'll let you... I actually knew I was coming up here with my ladies group hat on and I forgot about I was possibly going to be asked up to talk about this. Just a reminder that next week we're having a family service. It'll be slightly different format um, and the children will stay in throughout, the older children and the younger children and we hope that we will create something that the whole family can enjoy together. Needless to say sometimes very little ones might find it a bit much but the, the room upstairs will be available if anybody wants to bring their child up and we'll, I'm sure Bradley we can get the, the, the screening up there so you won't miss anything. So that's next week, I hope it's in your calendars already. Some of the children will be taking a part, although it's not a big, a big production or anything like that, but just um, let's see you all there next week. Um, do I have the announcements for the next item? Oh yes, yeah, sorry, we are continuing from last week, we had a little hint about what the theme was going to be. I really should be better prepared because this was my idea. Um, we had three, three picture clues last week. I don't know if any, of you, um, if any of you worked out what it was about. We had, can anybody remember? We had a book. What sort of a book was it, Tilly? The book of baby names. We had a picture of vegetables. Just the penny dropping with anybody. We had a picture of somebody dreaming. Today we have a rather strange picture clue. Looks like somebody is writing on the wall. Hope you're all excited to hear where that well-known phrase, the writing is on the wall, came from. Our next one. Anybody tell me what's happening in this picture, what this lady is doing? Praying, Praying. okay. Clue number six, Brad. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> that actually shocked me. It was way more effective than I expected. So I think lots of you now, certainly with that final clue, might have an idea where we're going with next week's service. So I hope we see lots of you here. Okay. All right. Um, yes, so I, I also wanted to just have a quick word about this. Um, not our last ladies' gathering, but the one before we had a suggestion box for social events, for um, community outreach and mission, um, and it's time to put, your, to put your hands up and get involved. So there's a couple of things coming up. Obviously, with Christmas coming, um, we look to get involved with things that we've been doing before. So I just want to highlight a few. These are all great opportunities, particularly for our ladies' group to get involved. Um, I'm going to send out an email during the week with more details, but these two need a kind of a heads up now because um, certainly that first one time is ticking away on it. So I think most people at this stage know that we like to give a small token to the very kind neighbours in the chimes that allow us every week to trail in in our cars and park and disturb the peace of their Sunday morning. Um, and by bringing, that, bringing them something small, we remind them that we're here and we don't just need them as a parking place, that maybe they might come and visit us. So we like to bring them something. Valerie is very kindly organising this as she's done in the past. So she's looking for people who think they may be able to get involved. Either if you can think of something small that could go into the little gift bags or baskets that you'd like to provide, some home baking or something that you feel you could go out and buy. Um, 
you can volunteer for that or if you'd like to help I think we're planning to have these ready by December the 10th and distribute them that day after church so maybe you would just like to help distribute them so if you would like to be involved in that please let Valerie know you can either talk to her today or I'll send her number out in the email this week the second item the flowers ministry I think and I know Brad shows one of your favorite things are these lovely flowers every Sunday morning. So everybody's used to seeing them. We're very grateful to the ladies. Typically the ladies, I don't know, are there any men that get involved? Probably not. <laughs> but I know the ladies do a great job in providing them. But what a lot of you might know, but many of you may not know, is what happens to those flowers every Sunday. Um, they don't actually go back home with the donor. Um, a very small and dedicated group of one or two have a mission where they have, I suppose, a flower ministry where they visit members of our congregation that perhaps can't get out or maybe are, are ill in hospital, have something going on in their lives where we feel it would be nice just to remind them that the church is thinking of them and we say it with flowers as the interflora, um, as the interflora ad goes. It's, it's a really big effort and it's every week. And as I say, at the moment, there's just one or two doing it that I know of. Um, and it feels like this could be a great fit for the ladies group. So I will send out more details during the week, but if you feel that that's something that you'd like to do, we'd love to get a rota going. So maybe one person would take it on month at a time, or maybe there's just certain dates you say, yeah, I can do it that Sunday. But it involves taking the flowers after church on the Sunday and going to visit. And it turns into not just a handing over of flowers, but a, a ministry where, a visiting ministry, if you like, where we can we can reach out to the people that aren't able to get to us every week. Okay, so watch out for your emails, ladies. It's going to be in a ladies' group email. And if there's anybody sitting here today that goes, what is the ladies' group? Can I be a part of that? Come and see me. I'll put your name on the email list, no problem. Okay? Not you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Nadine. And to continue with our announcements, um, with a few people who... who They've asked us to pray for them, or we know they need our prayers, especially now. Um, Rachel, you remember Rachel and Roger? They come very regularly to church. Rachel lost her mom, and so they're in the UK. So please remember, Rachel, it's a difficult time for them now. Also, Craig McCoy, Craig's sister-in-law and brother, they worship here, and he's undergoing chemo. Um, please pray for him. Also, I heard this morning um, from, our, uh, from Diana, who is at, from Elmsley, that Roy, Roy McGregor, the youth pastor at Elmsley, his wife has just lost the twins at seven months. So Roy, yes, it's really sad. Seven months is still a viable age, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but he had to rush off to Jamaica. Um, we continue to pray for those who are not well and those who would love to come to church but can't come out. Uh, we come now to our evening at mu of music at John Gray. Have I announced it already? I think so, but you need to remember that, please. And also the, the National Choir. I think their event at Elmsley is coming up soon. We always love to visit that. I don't remember the dates but you can look out for the National Choir and their performance. Two nights, it usually is, at Elmsley. Birthdays. Have I forgotten anything, Miss Juliet? No. Oh, quite a few here today. We have Alero, that's Birch's sister. That's to cheese today. For Perry. Lynn, is Lynn with us today? I think I see a head behind there. We'll sing especially loud for Lynn. Gay and Carolyn. Shelley Duval. Oh. My granddaughter, Kristen. <laughs> they have not gone to um, Catholic Church. Oh, yes, I remember. Thanks. Uh, anybody else? No? And anniversaries? Uh, well, let's sing a happy birthday. <laughs> I 
As we continue to praise God, it's time for us to stand and sing. Somebody's discovering their voice today. That's good. I'll invite you to stand and sing. That's fine. With us. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. Let us sing happily and joyfully. to the Lord in prayer. Gather us into your presence, great God of peace. We trust that your vision for the world, the great creation of your imagination, entrusted to us as a place for our flourishing, is still there behind all the challenges of our lives. We come today remembering that even in the darkest of days, your flame of hope and new life flickers, drawing us on to find the good and to illuminate the world with your gospel of love. Help us to find you in the smallest of things and the most ordinary of our experiences. For you are the great source of our being and the power that sustains us through your Holy Spirit. When we search hard for you, we may miss your presence in the everyday. So help us to look out for you in the face of friend and stranger in the wonder and beauty of our world, in the complexity of design, in the creativity of artist and scientist. Lord of the ages, our hope in times of trouble, 
and our consolation in grief. Bring us a spirit of renewal so that your people may honor those who have given their lives in service to their country in conflict. May their service kindle in us the desire for peace and unity, which is your hope for all people. This we pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Let us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. All right. um, we have uh, our missions moment scheduled for today, the Gospel Growers presentation of the school in Haiti. This should be done by Karen. I'm not sure if she's here today. Oops. Hello, Miss Karen. Welcome. Good. Good to have you. But we're going to do the children's songs first so that they can go to Sunday school. I would really like them to hear the missions moment, but um, I know they need time in Sunday school to prepare. So, Miss Karen, before um, I call you up to introduce you, let us remain seated as we sing together two songs. And children, this is especially for you. Now, Mr. Michael, you can sing. All right? I got that right. I got that. So it's two songs. Um, by the way, children, are you preparing any plays at school at this time? Any Christmas plays? Hands up if you're doing any Christmas plays. Yay, good. And um, so perhaps you're going to be singing some of these songs during the Christmas plays. So let's sing with and for these children two lovely carols. You know, somebody last week had to put in a carol in the service. And this week, I had to outdo that person, Mr. Clyde, and put two carols in. In fact, three. So two for the kids. And we're going to sing together um, very familiar carols, of course. Ever old, but ever old, but always new. Ever new, always old. Away in a manger and ding dong merrily on high. So let's remain seated as we sing Away in a Manger.
Miss Karen up to talk to us about gospel growers. Now it's the first time I'm meeting you, Miss Karen. So I'm going to rely on you to tell us a bit about yourself first yeah. and your involvement in this. We're just very happy to have you here. Our church has been contributing towards Haiti's um, appeal for help. You know, Haiti really needs a lot of help at this time. You never just about in every in every area that you can think of. Am I right, Miss Karen? Pretty much. Yeah. Okay, pretty much. <laughs> and we are happy to be able to help in whatever way. And Miss Karen is here to tell us a bit more about what's happening with this movement in during our missions moment now, the gospel growers. Great. Cool. Well thank you. Hi. Um, my name's Karen. I'm from the US, from New Jersey. How many of you are familiar with gospel growers? Anybody? Not a lot of people, some people. Okay, great. Um, Gospel Growers, as she said, is based in Haiti. It was by, started by Sam Rice and Bob and Angie Brannon back in 2001, 2002. Um, it's a mission on the southern coast of Haiti um, that Sam started with the heart to raise up the people of Haiti to kind of take over and um, help their own country. Um, so I'm here just to give you kind of an update of what's going on, what's still running, some of the needs. Um, I'll try to keep it to 10 minutes. I'm going to set my timer <laughs> so I can keep myself on track. Um, to those of you that know Sam, he does send his welcome or his hello um, and his gratitude for ongoing support all these years um, as you have sponsored a lot of the programming that still happens. So next slide. Uh, Sam has his own little report. He lives in Pittsburgh now. He's no longer able to travel. So um, I am on the board. He brought me on two years ago. Um, I've been, I grew up in a church that knew about uh, gospel growers. My mom is a nurse. She was very interested in his clinic. So I kind of knew about it all along. In my 20s, for about four years or so, I went back and forth to Haiti. I observed at Sam's mission. I observed and lived at a mission on the um, Northwest, in the Northwest as well, um, and always just kind of had a heart for Haiti. My story is very intrinsically tied to everything that was Haiti and has been Haiti in my life. Um, so we'll listen to Sam's report and I'll go through the four um, missions that are run through Gospel Growers and then at the end, at the very end of the service, if you guys have any questions, you can ask me, okay? All right, you can play. All right, go ahead. This is Sam Rice, president of Gospel Growers. You might be wondering why we decided to name our missionary organization Gospel Growers. According to Mark chapter 4, verse 3 and 8, it states, Consider this, a sower went out to sow. Some seeds fell onto good, rich soil that kept producing a good harvest. Mark 4:14 4, states, Let me explain. The farmer sows the message of the kingdom. Verse 20. But what is sown on good soil represents those who open their hearts to receive the message and their lives bear good fruit. Gospel Growers is a missionary organization that is focused on getting the soul-liberating good news about Jesus Christ to the Haitian people. We attempt to do this through preaching, the teaching of God's word, and by encouraging and operating ministries, such as a Christian radio station, staffed by volunteer Haitian Christians, a medical clinic run by a Haitian nurse, and by financially assisting seven small churches and their Christian schools through our student sponsorship program. We distribute Bibles, hymnals, and Sunday school materials to these churches and help them have the means to operate their resource dark schools. This enables the schools to remain open and to educate the future leaders of Haiti. It also provides bases to use for evangelizing the surrounding communities. We take the great commission of Jesus Christ very seriously. Gospel Growers was created in 2002 through the cooperative efforts of Bob and Angie Brannon, former members of Ministries in Action, a Florida-based missionary organization, and me, a missionary nurse based in Dariol, Haiti. 
Since 2002, we had been discipling young Haitian Christians with the view of them taking over the ministries that I had originally started or encouraged. These young leaders have a vision to reach their nation with the gospel, and our part is providing them with the financial resources to do the work. Through interested American churches and sponsors, we have so far been able to make their vision a reality. Please prayerfully consider helping us to help these Haitians to reach their country and lift them out of the dark and into the light of God's kingdom. Thank you very much. All right. So as you see, Sam started it. It's been going for 21 years. That's one of the things I'm most encouraged by. He has fostered relationships and raised up a bunch of um, Haitian men and women that are now continuing programming. So you can go to the next slide. This is the um, Haiti committee down um, in Darial and Port-au-Prince and Lacaze, they oversee all the activities and actions that Gospel Growers is still running. Um, they manage funds in the areas. Um, when I went to Haiti, they actually were all my mentor or my um, tour guides. So the second one in Nilio, he traipsed me all over the country, southern coast. We uh, went fishing, we hiked, we always had about a tribe of 10 kids following us. Ariel on the left is the secretary, so if you sponsor children, he's the one that gets the letters all together and sends them back um, and kind of runs the school sponsorship program. John Denny in the middle, he's one of my dearest friends. I met him, uh, I was 21, and <laughs> I met him at a church service on the southern coast, and he said, one day we'll work together. And I was like, no, we will not work together. I don't know what you're talking about. But here we are, um, partnering together. He lives in Port-au-Prince. He kind of oversees all the programming, and then Pradel helps with it as well. So that's the committee that Sam has known for over 20 years, kind of raised up. Can go to the next one. This is where, this, the red dot is Dariel, where the mission is located. There are seven different areas um, where schools and churches are supported, but the clinic, the health clinic, um, and one of the churches is in Dariel there. Um, and then it's just the surrounding areas. So that just gives you an idea of where the mission is located. Next. Uh, the clinic is, so Sam is a registered nurse. He started the clinic. That's actually what he went to Haiti with originally. He had set up five or six other clinics around the country with missionary ministries in action um, and then kind of went off on his own and started Gospel Growers. So currently run by a Haitian nurse. This is in Dariel. Um, they... It's functioning as best it can with the current state of the country. The fuel costs are really high, so getting medication can be challenging. Um, getting in back and forth because of uh, lack of fuel, just general transportation. But they help as many people as they can. Over the course of 21 years, they've seen over hundreds of thousands of um, Haitians to help them. They have a vision, so John Denny met with them. One of their visions is to build a bigger clinic in the area. Uh, they'd like to add a prayer room. They would like to do their own testing. So again, have a vision. Hopefully, we'll see where God leads over time, um, if that can happen. But uh, that's the clinic, so next. The schools, as Sam said in his introduction, there's seven schools. This year, there's 330 students that are being supported. Uh, the funds primarily go towards um, the salaries for the teachers and the directors and then sponsoring the kids in their uniforms. Those are the seven areas where they're located. Uh, they get a Christian, they're all Christian teachers. Um, so they get a Christian education as well as just their regular um, academic education. Um, lots of areas where things can be improved there as well. They're still looking to get food, um, a meal at every uh, during the school day. Um, Ariel, the man who's on the original committee, he has his own little food program, and Sam ha would like to help build that up as well so we can get them more food. But the schools are functioning. Um, next slide. They each have a little bit of a different uh, way that they function. I'm not going to go through each of the um, quotes, but John Denny went and met with them, and they all kind of gave their um, how their schools run, shared how their schools operate. Um, John Denny would has a vision, has would like to get exam results and kind of a more uh, fluid relationship between the sponsors and the students, but. 
Seven schools running next. Um, additional needs, there's always needs. The needs are great. Like I said, they would like to add a feeding program, pro um, potentially um, some schools don't have enough current, don't have enough to meet their current needs. Potentially over time we could get more um, students into the school, enrolled in the school. But down at the bottom, that's just a picture of the directors for each of the different schools with that original uh, four committee. So that's the school systems. Next. Uh, last month, actually, they did get Bibles, so 98 Bibles were, um, New Testament Bibles were donated to gospel growers and given to the young adults. So there is a ministry where, um, again, it's a Christian ministry, so they're raising, they want to do the Christian education as well. So these are just two of the schools, Dubois and Metayer, um, where it's, uh, young adults receive their New Testament Bibles. They do Bible studies. They um, try to raise up the kids in that messaging. All right, next. This, I'm not gonna have us play the videos, but these are just cute videos. At the end of the year, they always do a report card ceremony, so they really love celebration ceremony. Um, so these two videos were just choreographed dances that they did um, at the end of the year to celebrate the completion of their school year. Um, it'll take too much time, I'm running out of time, but that was that. Um, and then the churches are the other things that are supported by Gospel Growers. So there's two main ones. This is Metair. They're actually currently looking to finish building it. You can see it's kind of in process. There's John Denny in the top left um, standing. I'm almost done, I promise. Um, standing in the top left. Um, so they're looking for additional funds to finish the school. They need about 7,500 US uh, dollars. That is what Pastor Rodriguez sent um, as the plea to finish building their school. So that's Metair. Next, Dubois here. This one is a fully um, running church and school. The kids go there for school, but they, that's Dubois, which we support. Next. This is kind of a cool project um, in the area where Dubois is, an American NGO called Build On. Um, came in and they built a school. It was last summer, about six months ago. They built a school um, for the Dubois community. You can see it's a three-room schoolhouse with their outhouses. They require $2,500 US to um, start the project and then they go in and build. If you're interested, you can just Google buildon.com and it tells you kind of what their process is, but they're looking to build an additional three rooms. Um, and those funds we're looking for, but that's in Dubois. So that's another thing going on down there. And then the radio station is the last thing. This is kind of Sam's heart um, that he really loves, but there's a radio station that plays all over the airways in the southern part of Haiti. They have songs, they have conversation. They just celebrated their 21st um, anniversary, actually, over the summer, and it was broadcast through Facebook. There's a group of 10 Haitian men who have been raised up through um, gospel growers, went to the schools, and they're now running the radio station. So they govern the radio station, they play. Um, Fortunately, right now the antenna is down, um, so that it's in Port-au-Prince getting fixed, but they're also looking for additional um, new mixers, new materials um, to get the radio station running. But it's really a blessing for that area. Whenever it's down, the Haitians are um, upset that it's not playing, and after it comes back up, calling, just saying what a, um, how much they love and appreciate the radio station. So that's another aspect. This just says the transmitter's down. You can go to tunein.com and Radio Cements FM. If you're interested, you can listen to the radio station. So it's really cool. All right, next. Um, always lots and lots of needs, as I said. The church, um, mainly just praying for the vision as we're moving forward. The Haitians are running the programming, but what that looks like, how we can grow, what um, just how we can continue to support this mission, if you guys could pray over that. and. Um, that would be great. And just remembering that Haiti always is in trouble, but the gang violence, the unrest, everything is pretty heightened right now. So just keeping Haiti in mind. Next. Last thing, I'm currently working with one of my friends, Matt. We're updating the website. Um, so eventually you'll be able to just go on the website and get these updates. And that's it. So thank you for giving me time to speak. Sorry I went over. <laughs>
because even though he's not living there. So thanks so much for that and forgive me for not recognizing you at first. I was hoping that Betty Ann would be here to introduce you. She had a migraine, oh dear, sorry, sorry to hear. But anyway, we'll help wherever we can, I'm sure. And now it's time for our scripture reading. And Ms. Birch will go come up for us. Good morning. This morning lesson is from Joshua chapter 24, reading from verses 15 to 17 and then 21 to 25. I was promised by someone I will not name that there were no difficult words in this passage. <laughs> However, <laughs> verse 15, but if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourself this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, far be it from us to forsake the Lord to serve other gods. It was the Lord our God himself who brought us and our fathers up out of Egypt from that land of slavery and performed those great signs before our eyes. He protected us on our entire journey and among all the nations through which we traveled. Verse 21. But the people said to Joshua, no, we will serve the Lord. Then Joshua said, you are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen to serve the Lord. Yes, we are witnesses, they replied. Now then, said Joshua, throw away the foreign gods that are among you and yield your hearts to the Lord, the gods of Israel. And the people said to Joshua, we will serve the Lord our God and obey him. On that day, Joshua made a covenant for the people and there at Shechem, he drew up for them decrees and laws. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Birch. In preparation for our sermon, let us remain seated as we sing. Verse 1, Master, speak, thy servant heareth. That remains our prayer, loving God, that you might speak to us, that we might listen, that we might, in following you, find direction and purpose, and that we might love and faithfully serve you in all things in all of our lives. Bless now your word to our hearts as we meditate on it. Bring us the insights that will support that desire to follow you. And we pray it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. As we contemplate our conversations around what it means to deepen our faith and our journey together as God's people, we talk today a little bit about the wisdom that we need. And a wisdom that in Joshua's example leads him to choosing and inviting others to choose God. To choose or not to choose. Is that really a choice? For when you choose or not choose, aren't you choosing? 
life is indeed filled with many choices, and a lot of times we do not know what the outcome might be. An angel appeared in a faculty meeting in a local college and went to the dean, the angel did, and said to, to her, in return for your un unselfish and exemplary service over all of these years, the Lord has chosen to reward you. Uh, and so uh, we're giving you a choice. Would you want infinite wealth? Sorry, infinite wealth, infinite wisdom, or infinite beauty? person to whom the angel spoke, she didn't hesitate very, very long. She says, give me infinite wisdom. And so kapow, done, the angel said before he disappeared off in a cloud of smoke. So, of course, all the colleagues of this dean turned looking to see what would emanate from her now and asked her, well, say something brilliant. So she stands with the pose of Socrates and she says, I should have taken the money. <laughs> Life is risky, but it is full of choices, and often we don't know the outcome of these choices. But I think the text from Joshua's story, which comes to the end of his life while he is calling on his people who are following him, people who he has been leading, the story tells us some things about his and our choice and the choice that we're invited to embrace as we seek God's wisdom. It is a real choice in the first instance. Note that Joshua's challenge comes at a particular moment. Um, it comes against the backdrop of their shared history, their shared experiences. It comes at a point in time. Usually, we have a moment in life. He becomes uh, or he's summoned to his moment in life. And you and I usually have some kind of a moment. Oftentimes those moments come, and sometimes we have several moments, or hopefully over the course of our lifetime. Some of those moments come in, in, in good places, when, 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 when things are going well, when there is something to celebrate or be, or be happy about. And sometimes some of those moments come in points where we are at the rock bottom where we are facing difficult or challenging circumstances. But in those moments, we have opportunity for a choice. There's always a genuine choice that, at, that is at, at stake. Nothing that Joshua says to the people to whom he speaks is compelled. Or he, 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 he puts them in the place to know that this is their moment. It may be evil in your eyes, to serve God, he says. Other translations try to s soften it up a little bit and say you might be unwilling or it might, might be undesirable to you. But he is saying maybe it is not a good thing in your mind in this moment to serve God. Maybe it seems like a bad choice, but this is your moment. How oftentimes we find ourselves in moments when we have to rise to the occasion or not rise to the occasion when we are, 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 are faced with something that we need to say or do, and it becomes a difficult space in which to act. Because whatever you do, there are consequences, and there's a difficulty that could emanate from the choice that you make. I don't know about you, but one member of my congregation had a conversation with me this week because she is Jewish of Jewish descent, and had a challenge around what was happening. But obviously, she was experiencing the challenge from her history, and with her own experience and, 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 and connection, and connectedness to that part of her, she was in a place of difficulty trying to figure out, um, uh, what, what about these other people? That was a moment for me, because I, and I'm not sure, I'm not said, suggesting to you that I rose to the moment, by the way, because I am not sure if I allowed simply my, my diplomatic self to speak, or I spoke truth, or, or, or whatever that is, or maybe because I myself challenged by it. But in that moment, it forced me to recognize 
that this is something what is happening between Israel and, and, and Palestine at this time is something that is going to be seen very differently by whoever is looking at it. And here was I in the middle, or attempting to be in the middle. But how can you really be in the middle when things need to be firmly spoken on? Here is the moment. We are called in places in our lives to make a decision. And Joshua says, this is that moment for you. You can't simply fudge around. You can't simply just do nothing, for that is making a choice too. But you have to make a choice. Will you serve the Lord? Uh, as I suggest to you, I don't know how many of you have had moments um, recently or who continue to have moments, but maybe one of those things is what is the place of your faith in your life? What is the place and the strength of your commitment to Christ in your life? How does that impact how you live? We've been on that kind of a streak over the last few weeks, talking about the fact that there must be a connection between what we believe and what we do, between what we think and theologize or, or, or talk about God and how it informs our worship and our actions. What is a choice and what is a moment? The fact is that uh, for many of us, um, Christianity falls at a very kind of our faith life forms as a, very, as a backdrop to the rest of our lives. We're enjoying life very well and you know you're going to go home and have something to eat, right? And you are going to have probably a glass of wine later on, maybe too many glasses of wine. <laughs> and you're going to have a, a, a good time with friends. And you're going to be able to, to share in those uh, places of, 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 of joy, of peace. And your faith becomes simply a backdrop to all of that. But how much of your faith tells you what it is that you must do with the rest of your life? with how you interact with others, with how you work in the workplace, with the, the call that God has on our lives. It is a real choice. Point is, they had a moment, and Joshua stands and he says, this is the moment. Part of our challenge is that we, 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 we for either on one hand, we have one moment and that's the only moment. You know, I remember when, in 53 years and two months ago, I came to know Christ as Savior. That was a moment. Wonderful. But what about the other moments? What about how that moment has impacted this moment in which we stand? Or the other moments of our lives? So there is a place for choice. It's a real choice. But I think also that Joshua's story informs our own story and suggests that this choice has to be based on our memory. It certainly was for them. In the light of Joshua's rhetorical challenge, the people affirm that they are going to love the Lord and they will never forsake him and they will never serve other gods. But are they only imitating their leader? In, in fact, they, they made the point that they're not because they go on to offer their reasons from verses 2 to 13 of Joshua 20, uh, 24, they offer um, some, some reason. God gives some reason uh, or God's version of the story and suggests that God's reasons why the children of Israel should choose God. But they also talk about their own reasons for choosing God. They arrive at this, this decision in true freedom and integrity by telling their own story. They begin by naming the relationship that they claimed that allows them to claim God as their own. They say, Yahweh is our God. And then they profess that God has brought us and our parents up from Egypt, from slavery. And they remember that God has secured their freedom. They have something, a basis from their story on which they are making the present decision to serve God. What is our story? I think all of us have a story of some sort. And if you don't have a story, then you probably need to determine what is that story with God? Because um, if I were to ask you this morning, and what would you like to share a testimony? 
share a story of your, of your faith. There should be something that we are, are cultivating out of our, our intimate relationship with God that tells something about God's journey with us. Because the truth is that, is, is that we all have a story. We all have a testimony, whether sometimes we pay attention to that or we lean into it or we develop that testimony, develop that relationship so we can speak about God in the ways that they spoke about God. They tell it from their own words. They declare their commitment to serve God. And while that declaration is climactic, the words that follow after it are important. We will serve God because Yahweh is our God. Can you speak that out of your own experience this morning? Can you speak with that kind of a conviction and, and, and uncertainty that God is my God? Even when we can't see God in the spaces that we find ourselves. Even when God's hand might seem to be hidden. Are we able to trust the heart of God? in that place. You have to have your own experience with God, and that is going to help to take you through the times of difficulty. It's hard for you to have an experience of God in the space of difficulty. You have to have that experience somewhere, somewhere before, so that when you get to that place, you can say, I will still trust the Lord. Those three Hebrew boys facing the fiery furnace, you remember that story, right? And they said, we believe that our God will deliver. You remember the rest of the words that they, uh, they said? But even if he doesn't, we will trust God. We will not bow. There has to be a faith that comes out of your experience. Their choice is based on their experience and their memory. But I leave with you the third thing about their own experience of choosing in this moment as, as Joshua calls them to, to, to surrender, is that the choice that they make is a choice to move from slavery to surrender. Israel responded very enthusiastically when Joshua asked, um, you know, choose this day, serve God. Will you serve God? They responded, we also will serve the Lord. Joshua had kind of thrown down the gauntlet. He had said, as for me and my household, we, well, we are going to do it. They said, well, we too will do it. And you would have expected perhaps that Joshua, having hear, heard that, is a preacher's dream, eh? You, you preach and everybody says, amen. Let's go do that, you know? I, I'm on board with you. <laughs> but Joshua doesn't take the amen. He instead replies very sternly in verse 19. You cannot serve the Lord. God is jealous for your love, and God will not forgive you endlessly and without consequence. If you forsake God, God will consume you after having done you good. Wow. Why would he have been speaking to this in this kind of a way? People are urgent, urgently responding, answering God. No, back to Joshua, no, no, we will serve the Lord. But the verb that is used in that context, in that passage, occurs several times um, in, in, verse, in verse 14, verses 15 to 18, several times. And it has a range of meeting, meanings. The same verb keeps recurring. That verb that we have translated as to serve the Lord. It means to be a slave. It means to serve. It means to work. It means to worship. All of those meanings are coming out of it. So the link between worship and service and slavery is critical in understanding the choice that Joshua is offering to the Israelites that we are being invited to, to embrace. They will give their whole selves, and that's what God requires. All of us, all, the whole of us, he is requiring a life of surrender. For worship of false gods, as he says, you have to give up the gods of your, 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 your ancestors that they worshipped in other places. He says the worship of those false gods is a sla slavery to human <coughs> artifice and to self-interest. Instead, you have to say, I will serve the Lord alone and totally. I will be devoted to God completely. When 
they did that, they then would experience the movement away from being Pharaoh's servants to being God's servant. It's always interesting to me how the scripture uses those kinds of um, bits of language to talk about how we engage with God because it's always great to hear that we're freed from something and you're kind of like, no, you're free. But the freedom he gives us is a freedom to love God and to serve God with all of our hearts. Um, when, 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 when Jacob called on his family to put away the gods of their ancestry and the foreign gods that they had taken on, he buried those gods under a tree at um, Shechem, an oak tree at Shechem. And, and this is a, a kind of a, a throwback to that when he says, if you're going to truly follow, if you're truly going to go after what God says, then you must be willing to surrender all of those things to God. So I asked us the question, what are those things that we, are, we have buried underneath the tree um, somewhere? Things that we might have beneath the ground under our feet that we must put away. We must remember to, to keep forsaking. Because you see how quickly people you and I, turn away from what we have promised. When, when, when Moses came down out of Sinai with the word of God, um, people were, well, you know, were, were really excited about it, but how quickly they turn, how quickly we too can turn. There's a wisdom that we need, a wisdom that chooses God and God's way. And that's the wisdom for which we pray this morning. So I close with two complementary things, things that are true. They seem almost opposite, but really two sides of a coin, two complementary realities with which we are faced and where we need wisdom in our lives. All of our lives is ultimately about God. Joshua knew it all too well. The future of God's people depended ultimately not on the people's sincerity, on their faithfulness and our, our obedience, but it depended on God's faithfulness, God's mercy, God's powerful word, and God's ability to transform hearts. We are not who we are, and we cannot be who we, God desires us to be because of anything that we do. It is what God does. But it is our responsibility too. So it is all about God, but it is our responsibility. For Israel would suffer severe consequences for abandoning God over the years to come. How many times they would be brought back into exile because of the choices they make. How many times we find ourselves in places where we declare our undying love and devotion towards God, but make choices that don't honor that, and then we have to live with the consequences of those. We must always be watchful Keep awake, be ready to meet God so again we can choose him over and over. As for me and my household, we will serve God. It starts with me, it's corporate, we, we will serve the Lord. Uh, a, a, a young student wanted to play a trick on his elderly teacher because he thought his teacher was getting old, and so he was a little bit brighter than the teacher. So he decided one day he'd catch a small bird and cup it in his hand and hold it in behind his back. And the plan is that he would go to his teacher and ask him what it is that he had in his hand. And if the teacher um, said correctly what it was, he'd then ask, is it dead or alive? And if the teacher said it was dead, then of course he would bring out a live bird. But if the teacher said it was alive, he would crush it. Okay. And so he went to his teacher and he said to the teacher, what do I have in my hand? He says, a bird, my son. So he says to him, is it dead or is it alive? And he says so, of course, with a little sheepish grin. And the teacher, a wise old sage, thought for a moment and then replied, 
The answer to that question, my son, is in your hands. It's in your hands. It's in your hands. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Let us pray. We give you thanks, God. For your word which encourages us, for your spirit that walks alongside us, for your people who share in our story of faith. We pray that you would grant us wisdom, wisdom that flows from choosing your way, the wisdom that comes from time in your word, and the wisdom that comes from walking with you in prayer and worship. We crave the wisdom that comes from intimacy with and surrender to you, Almighty God. You are the preserver and creator of all things, and we, we come to you especially in the times when we have needs. And we pray for all people, and especially those who are in, in any kind of distress and challenge and need through famine and war or natural disasters. We pray that you would make your ways known throughout the world. Make your saving power known to all people. And God, that you would help us to lighten their burden and to seek justice and peace for all people. And so God of all grace and comfort, we pray that you come now and heal those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. We lift up those who are challenged and in the midst of uh, a long road of recovery and who feel discouraged and tempted sometimes to just give up, that, Lord, you will remind them that this is a moment when you invite them to, to declare their trust in you. Pray for those who, whose joy has been turned into crushing and debilitating sorrow and pain. God, you will come near and grant relief and help and mercy and that in time you will give them hope to see beyond this moment. Remember this day those who have died, died in furtherance of human freedom. And Lord, we pray especially for those who are grieving the loss of those that they miss, that you will give them your peace. We rejoice with thankful hearts that you have given us this beautiful world in which to work and play. A world that is full of wisdom and majesty. We offer our praise with deepest gratitude. And we thank you for your bountiful blessings. So this morning as we leave the sanctuary, we return a portion of your blessing to us. We pray that you would use these offerings and these tokens of our devotion to increase wisdom in the world, to protect those who are weak, to bless the vulnerable, to heal the sick, and to comfort the afflicted. All of these things we pray. We pray them only because of the great and mighty work of Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Amen. Thank you, Rev. Donovan. Our going forth hymn, I selected this not just because I love the Christmas hymns, but mainly because of the line, peace on earth, goodwill to men. Let us stand as we sing together, it came upon the midnight clear.
go forth with the wisdom of God, and may the blessings of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you today and every day.